Um, so, as Kate said, my name's Laura Landy. I run a small foundation based in New Jersey. Um, and what we're trying to do is to redesign the American health system with a few million dollars a year to spend. Um, and with, that's really our goal. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about how we're, how we're trying to do that, who we're working with, some of the partners that we've engaged, and, and some of the story about how we actually came, came to this. Now, now, where we start, where I start, is really with a, an assumption that we all know that what we're doing now is unsustainable, that we've been doing this for a long time. We keep trying to reinvent solutions, and we keep reinventing the same solutions over and over again. And we try them, and they go away, and we try them, and we go away. And we start to look at that, and we say, gee, what's going on here? Why is it that if we look at the models of, of healthcare systems, which people hold up to us, and if we look at the kind of measures that we have of what done is, can be done right, and if we look at the programs that the people in this room are talking about and why you guys are here today, we have the motivation, we have the aspirations, we have the models, but why don't we do it? Why can't we fix the healthcare system? And what's particularly challenging for me and, and for the, our foundation was to really understand and to really viscerally understand that this isn't new. So when I got to the foundation about seven years ago, as, as it's had, I'd been on the board for, for a number of years before that, we went back into the history of the foundation and we started reading the writings of the fellow who was the first president been the nephew of the guy who had left the money, had been there for 30 years, and every year he would write a document to the board saying, this is what's going on in the world that you need to pay attention to. Not here's the money we spent, how we spent, here's what you need to pay attention to. And what he started to write in 1959, in 1959, he was writing in, in his documents, we need to create a, a, a hospital that is focused on the patient first, not focused on the care or focused on making the money, in 1959. In 1965, he started to talk about, we're creating an unsustainable health system. We can't afford to keep doing what we've just created to do. We need to think about redesign. And he started to talk about, we need to create, you know, train doctors and teams. We need to look at alternative medicine. We need to create a system that looks both at health and keeping people healthy, as well as treating people when they were sick. That's 1965. And in 1971, he funded a program at the Institute of Medicine to look at system redesign. So that's 50 years ago, 45 years ago. It's a long time. And we're still asking the same questions in any speech that Don Berwick makes these days is saying those same messages. So what's really going on here? Why are we stuck in this, in this system that we keep repeating where we know the, cha the change is possible, we know that the models are there? So I want to tell you a little bit, oops, I'm up on the screen. So I want to tell you a little bit about the models uh, and what the foundation is trying to do and how we've come to some of the, the approaches that we're taking. So let me start here. This is me, 17 years old, graduating from Walnut Hills High School, which is one of the top public high schools in the country. Um, that's my mom. My mom was the president of the League of Women Voters for a long time. My dad started an advertising agency when he was 23 and was very successful with it. Um, I, at this time, was going steady with the president of the senior class. I was the head of my sorority, high school sorority, um, which is a little crazy. And, and, you know, things just couldn't be better. I had been accepted to Washington University. I was heading off to college. I was just doing, doing awesomely great from the outside. But this is what was really going on. So what, what my inner reality was, and I felt like I should sign up for Susie's program or something, is that my parents were separated at the time that picture was taken. That, that what I had grown up with started when I was in seventh or eighth grade with Kennedy being shot. We went through the King assassination. We went through the Robert Kennedy assassination. There were, there were race riots in, in Cincinnati, in, in the neighborhoods around where I was living. You know, we, I got to college and suddenly we're faced with the draft. We're faced with Vietnam. You know, 500,000 of us are marching on Washington to, to, you know, with Nixon sitting there with the buses in front of, in front of the White House. Um, you know, Kent Place. Students are being shot at Kent Place. It goes on and on and on. This was my inner reality. You know, on the outside, it all looked great. On the inside, it's like, what am I doing here? Where do I fit? How do I find a place? How do I start to make sense of this? I said some of these programs would have been helpful to me. Um, so, so I get to Washington University. 
1968, my very first class, 8 o'clock, Monday morning, first class, you know, walk into this big conference room, tiered, lots of people in the, in the conference room, hundreds of students sit down in the front row, it's the only way I can pay attention. Um, and the professor there is a guy named Barry Commoner. So Barry Commoner, who actually died just a month ago in New York at the age of 95, was, uh, was an environmentalist. He was an activist. He, he was a fellow who would look at the environment and look at systems and start talk about how is, how is what we could, how we look at the environment related to the war? How is it related to poverty? How is it related to social action? How can we start looking at how these things are related so that we can see them differently and make a difference? Barry Commoner ran for president on an independent ticket in 1980 um, and, and, and started to create, create you know, a vision for what might be happening that he spent his life working on. Oops, sorry. Um, what he taught us in class, this was Botany 101, and why I took Botany 101, God knows, but Botany 101. I know nothing about botany, absolutely nothing. Um, but, you know, he taught us about cycles. So we're learning about the Krebs cycle, and we're learning about mitosis, and we're learning, we, we go out in the field and we study dirt. He gives us a square foot of dirt, and we've got to study the dirt and how, who's living in the dirt. And he talked a lot about water and, and the cycles of water and how they interact, and then what's living in the water and what depends on the water and what happens if we change the water and what happens if we pollute the water. And that he started, you know, not only to, to create this sense of how everything's connected, but he also started to teach us from this, this very social conscious point of view that links science with social policy, what he, what he called the four law, laws of ecology. And to put them briefly, the first law, well, this is actually the second law, I'll come back to the first one, but the second law was that everything must go somewhere. So that if you think about it, he basically said, or he did say, when we say we're gonna throw something away, there is no a way to put something to. There is no such place as a way. You know, things move, but they don't go away. The second thing that he said was that nature knows best, right? That, that man tries to improve on nature. Almost everything that we do to try to improve on nature is going to screw it up in some way. We're going to disrupt the system, whether we're doing it consciously or there are unintended consequences. The third thing he said is there's no such thing as a free lunch that everything has a cost associated with it, and that we either know that and see it, or we don't know it and we don't see it, but this is reality. And perhaps the most important lesson, at least that I took away from this, and applies to, to perhaps us today, is that, that everything is connected to everything else. Everything that I do, everything that you do, is connected in a way that maybe we can see and maybe we can't see, we probably can't really comprehend, but there is a reality to that. Going back to the video of, you know, if you shake somebody's hand and what's that impact and how do they affect others, we don't know the impact that we always have. But this creates a very profound point of view, which is I need to understand where I fit in the system if I'm going to make choices about what I do that are informed, creative choices. And I need to not only look at what's going to happen tomorrow, but what's going to happen in the long run, or else I'm not being a responsible steward of the planet, our resources, the health system, myself. Um, he, you know, and it also became very clear that you can't fix something you can't see. If I can only see my little bubble from my perspective, then how can I actually make change that works? And this might be a good lesson for some of our candidates in the, in the uh, current election. Um, but here we are. So you know, in health, if we look at health and we bring this thinking back to health, that, that we start to say, okay, maybe there's something in here that keeps us from making the progress that we really want to make. Maybe there's some, some way to think differently, some barrier we can break through. And it's almost like when we talk about a siloed system, that each of us is looking at the piece of the elephant and that we're all engaging with it. And to think about what might be different if we were all seeing the whole elephant. And what if we all understood the whole elephant and we could really design a system that took care of the whole elephant. So, so um, as, as, as we came into to the foundation with this aspiration to fix the healthcare system, we said, okay, I don't know how to do it. Seems people aren't 
to having a, a lot of success in doing this. You know, we've got some great models, but not everybody's looking like the Mayo Clinic out there. So, 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 you know, how are we going to learn how to do this? So we brought together a group of people who are just brilliant thinkers and change agents. And there are people like Don Berwick and Elliot Fisher were in the room who, who many of you might know, but also people like, um, like Marshall Gans, who organized Obama's grassroots campaign for the last election and, and created, has created systems of organizing and how do you actually mobilize people. And people like Peter Sangi, who created the concepts of management around a learning organization. And how do you actually create innovative management structures that actually let people to emerge and solve problems? And one of the people, or actually two people I want to talk about, one of the people who came into the room was a guy named Amory Lovins. Now, Amory in 1976 was, was, had written an article, a um, very influential article, that talked about our energy choices. And it was essentially saying, we've got, we've got two paths we can follow. We can go down sort of the nuclear you know, oil path, or we can really look at alternative energy. And that these are, these are almost mutually exclusive. You have to make a choice. And had, had a huge influence on the environmental movement. And continues to work as the chief scientist of the Rocky Mountain Institute. And, and one of the principles that he came up with this, with this article in the 70s was a concept called end use least cost which to me had a profound effect on how I think about things. And basically what Amory said in that is, let's think differently. Let's just think differently about how we're, what our problems are and how we solve them. So what if we start by saying, what do people really want? What are their aspirations? And the example that Amory uses is a hot shower and a cold beer. So people want a hot shower and a cold beer. They don't say, I want a nuclear power plant. Right? That's just not what they do. You know, I want an oil rig. They want a hot shower and a cold beer. So if I start with a hot shower and a cold beer and I back design the system, would I end up with a nuclear power plant? Or might I end up with a cup that has a little solar chip on the side of it that I stick on the window for five minutes and my beer is suddenly cold? And how do we, you know, what is that thinking? And we spend a long time with this group saying, okay, how would you apply that thinking to health? And it's, and it's a different way of thinking. So in health, if you say, you know, that curve, it's like we want to be die, we want to be born, we want to live healthy forever, and then we want to die really quickly and painlessly. Now that's the trajectory we want, not this, you know, I'm gradually getting chronic disease and, and, and in pain. So, you know, if that is the aspiration, if I was going to back design that system, what would it look like? What would a health system that's end use, least cost actually look like if I were, if I were to create it from scratch? And, and if that's the right system, how then do we actually get there? Another, another, um, another influencer, again from an environmental perspective, was Eleanor Ostrom. Now Eleanor, who, who again died just a couple months ago, great woman and a great loss. Uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her work on sustainable governance of common resources. So what does that mean? So, you know, she went out and looked at the fields that are shared by farmers who all put their sheep on the fields. And, and, and there's, a, there's a theory um, that Eric Harden came out with called the, the tragedy of the commons, which is that we are all inclined to be fully self-interested, you know, if I can put three sheep on the field, then you can put three sheep on the field, and then you guys can put three sheep on the field, and soon we have no field, and then we're all die, we all die. And that's the inevitable course of human nature. And what Lynn came along and said was, well, you know, there are places that have done this. There were lobster fisheries, or where shared water, or shared fields, where for generations on generations all over the world, people have somehow managed to maintain sustainable resources and to, to live and to thrive. You know, and maybe somebody isn't getting quite as wealthy, but maybe somebody isn't quite as poor and starving, but they managed to figure this out. So she went in and she studied this. And, and what she found was a set of eight principles that, that not all in all circumstances, but these eight principles really tend to be in place in those communities that are sustainable. And one of the key findings, she said, was that government can't do this alone. Government's important, government can't do it alone, the market can't do it alone, that what it really takes is a third way, 
which is about collaboration, it's about partnership, it's about understanding, it's about shared vision, it's about rules and sanctions. You know, she tells a story about the lobster fisheries and that if somebody violates the fishing rules, you know, you can be here for so long and then you have to move. You know, there's this graduated sanctions. The first thing, you get a pink bow tied to your, your fishing traps. The second is that you get your fishing traps smashed. And the third is you get your boat smashed. And that's the culture of the community that maintains their shared resource. And how, do they, how did they come to that as their solution? So, so Lynn taught us a lot, Amory taught us a lot, all these folks taught us a lot. And, 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 and part of what they taught us, part of what they taught us was that we really need to think about things differently. We really need to rethink, and we really need to rethink a lot of things, and we do need to rethink in health. So what is rethinking about? What's really the assumption behind what we're trying on? So, so let's, start, let's start here, all right? We all think. We all have ideas. We all believe in a certain view of reality. We have mental maps and mental models. And based on what we think, we take actions. We do things. And those actions then lead to results, right? Now, that seems to make sense and seems pretty logical. Problem is, sometimes the results are good, and sometimes the results aren't good. So too often, when the results aren't good, we do what's called reacting. So we go back, and we act again, but we act harder. So we throw more money at the same problem. You know, we tell our kids to study harder. You've just flunked this math test three times. Just go study harder. Well, maybe there's something wrong with something going on in this picture. So, so this cycle of reacting that we keep getting caught in doesn't really come up with a different result. We have no reason to expect it's going to come up with a different result. So then what we really need to do is shift the thinking. We need to introduce something into the system that says, OK, our thinking isn't so good. It isn't quite working. How do we create some new thinking that changes really how we think, that changes the actions that we take, that then comes up with a different result? May still be good, may be bad, but at least we've tried something different because we know what we're doing isn't going to work. So how do we now start to apply this in health? Um, one way is to look at models. So we go back to complex systems, the kind of stuff that Barry Commoner was talking about. And we look at the health system, and everybody says, this is really complex. We know this is really complex, and there are all these moving pieces, and there are all these moving players. And so you know, how do we get our hands around this? So this is a model of Hurricane Katrina, and that's really the effects of Hurricane Katrina. And um, you know, hopefully that's not what the East Coast is going to look like come Monday with these storms arriving. But what we use these models for, and what the weathermen even today are doing with these three storms converging, is saying, how do we bring together data, a lot of complex data, a lot of complex stories, what we know from the past, patterns of movement that we've seen in the past, and how can we be more creative, more accurate to, in our ability to talk about what the possible alternatives are? They can't predict exactly where Katrina is going to go. But they can actually say, look, there's, there's some possibility we should prepare. If you're down here, you probably don't have to worry. If you're somewhere in here, you know, take some precautions. Let's think about this a little bit differently. So we, we, look, at, we look at models in health. And, and I'm going to give, give one example. And I should stop touching that. One example, which is, is Pueblo, Colorado. Right, so a group came together in Pueblo, Colorado which is a community about an hour south of Denver. So it's got a 40% poverty level. Um, it has its health care premiums rising much faster than, than the uh, salaries are in the area. And its health outcomes are about the worst in the state of Colorado. So a group of people have come together, about 15 people, mostly from health care, um, around a triple aim effort working with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And um, they came in representing a lot of different efforts. They were doing a whole lot of stuff. They were playing with medical homes and hospice and, gee, what can we do to increase provider capacity or create more efficiency? They were doing stuff. And it was good stuff. At least they thought it was good stuff. But they weren't sure if it was good stuff. They weren't sure if the things they were doing and the money they were spending was being spent in the right place at the right time for the right purpose to get the results that they wanted. They had that question. They wanted to know the answer. The other thing, when they started to talk together, they said, oh, gee, there's all this other stuff. 
you know, the stuff that actually does affect whether people get sick and, and how quickly they get better and how they access the care system. And maybe we should start looking at what's going on with crime or socioeconomic status or what's going on in the environment. So this group of 15 from the beginning soon grew to a group of 45 that represented the whole system. And, but what they said is, look, we're all siloed. We're not looking at the same system. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing poverty, and you're talking about medical homes, and we are not talking the same language. And we're not seeing the same elephant here. So, so what did we do? So working with the Rethink Health modeling team, which is headed by Bobby Milstein, who some of you may know, a um, bunch of guys, brilliant guys uh, trained at MIT who, who do this kind of work in health and in the environment and other places, um, they started to draw a map of what the Pueblo health system looked like and what the interactions were. So that, that, that you know, I can, I can take an intervention, see what the target is, track where it goes, and ultimately find some path through the system. So for the folks in Pueblo, what this started to do was to say, OK, I can see where I fit in the system. I can see who I'm most closely related to. I can see how what I do affects what you do. We can start talking the same language because we're looking at the same map, and we can talk about how we relate to each other. And we can actually have a real conversation. And then up there, they start saying, well, gee, you know, where's the money going to come from that we're, 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 we're working with? And whose money is it anyhow? And who should control it? And should you guys control it over here? Should we control it over there? And how do we talk about that? And you know, how do we capture savings? And how much is invested? And what if everybody is insured? And what if they're not insured? So that we started to map out this and started those conversations. But Pueblo wanted the answers to their questions. They wanted to know what the best thing they could do for Pueblo was. So on top of that model, which is totally evidence-based, and I can give you all the documentation for what's behind it, it's not a black box, um, that, that they started to develop a list of those things that are interventions that they were really interested in, those things they were curious about. So it fell in the category of risk. You know, healthy behaviors, reduced crime pathways. They started to look at things we're doing around care, control mental illness, hospital-acquired affections, and then how we can actually manage costs. So they started to break these down and then look at funding, capturing savings, and then what's going on in the economy? How, what if we are insuring everybody? And started to create a user interface that they, as this diverse group, could do work coming together to say, OK, let's play out these scenarios. Let's see what would happen. And they literally were able to move levers and say, OK, you know, what if we do improve care for physical illness? What if we support adherence? You know, what if we do that only for the disadvantaged? What if we do these together? What if we put more money in as opposed to less, less money? And there are a number of these slide levers that, that you can manipulate. And they worked with this, and they worked with this, and they worked with this. They ran about 160 different models looking at the what if scenarios of what if we do this, what if we do that, what if we, if we um, you know, try something completely different we've never thought of before. And what? This is, this is the best plan that they came up with. And it's a combination of, it's a combination of, um, of care and care coordination, um, reducing, you know, reducing infections, but also things like the upstream. How do we really affect behaviors? How do we actually look at some of these socioeconomic issues? How do we look at access? And look at the numbers. This is 27 years out. There are graphs that show the spending curves and, and what the utilization and the impact curves are. But look at these categories. So we can get the death rate down by 20%. We can get severe physical illness down by 21% in this model. We can get health care costs down by 19%. You know, not only are we, they, they spent, by the way, they spent on this 1% of their total health care costs for a year in Pueblo. Um, for five years. So their, their, their 1% comes up to $10 million a year. They figured they could do this for five years, so their investment in this was $50 million over five years. Right? But at the end of the program, they've got $644 million left over that they can spend on roads and schools and parks and playgrounds and bike paths. Because what they have, they're doing is reinvesting the savings, capturing those savings, and using that money for the benefit of the community. 
you know, over here, equity, and down here, productivity. The employers are now getting 20% greater productivity. We have a chance now to influence the, the economy of Pueblo, which is one of the poorest areas, in, certainly in Colorado. So, you know, they show that this is doable. Um, but now what do they do? So they've got a group of people in the room. They've got this great plan that they think is really realistic. It you know, factored in the reality of their local community, the politics, the, the health care provider structure. And, and they started to look back and say, OK, what does it really take to get this done? And as opposed to what most organizations would do in this situation, they say, oh, let's just go do it. Let's just go try it. Let's just go start. What Pueblo said was, no, we're going to wait. We are going to build the infrastructure that we need in order to make sure that this is sustainable because this is long term. This is going to take time. This is something where we need to do it right. We need to have an organization that has this as their goal. We need a governance structure where we have the right people in the room making decisions. We need the measures that we need in place to make sure that we know what we're doing and we gain the feedback so that we can correct it. And we need to understand how we create the funding stream so this, this is sustainable. So where Pueblo is right now is with this plan, creating these structures to start creating a plan for implementation in the coming year. No, it's fine. So big question is why do we do this? Why do any of us do what we're doing? What motivates us to take on the hard problems, to really you know, tackle the problems of kids or of dads or of, or of, or of you know, amputations. I mean, what is it that motivates us? And we all have our reasons, and many of them are here in the room. But I think what, what is impressive is, is a couple of things. One is that, that people do care. There are people like people in Pueblo, like people in this room, who are really trying to make a difference. And we need to acknowledge that and capture it and support it. I think a second thing is that we know this is doable. We have models of systems around the country and around the globe that do a better job for less money than we do. We know this is doable. We just need to figure out how to get ourselves there. Um, we, also, we also know that the payback is really worth it. That if we're looking at, at, you know, again, as the presidential candidates are saying in their debate, education is key to this country. Where is the money going to come from? Infrastructure needs to be rebuilt in this country. Where is the money going to come from? Jobs need to be created in this country. If we don't tackle health care costs, we're not going to get that, that problem solved. So for me, a big part of my motivation is Julianne Daniel. Those are <laughs> emotional. Those are, you know, those are my kids. Dan's 22, having a ball, living in Aspen. Julianne's in graduate school, 25, at, at the Maxwell School, trying to study in social policy and how to fix the world. Um, you know, I want a better world for them. And I want a better world for me. And I want a better world for you. And, and that if we can hold on to those values and hold on to the motivation of what is going to actually get us where we need to go, this is what's really going to make a difference. And I really invite you to join us, to join together, and to really rethink how we do health and make a difference in this world. So thank you.